When we think about belonging to the church, we should have two clear ideas fixed in our minds. We should have the idea of the universal church, and we should also have the idea of the local church in our minds. The universal church, sometimes called the invisible church, is made up of every true Christian. Every man, woman, and child who has been acted upon by the Holy Spirit in such a way as to raise them from death to life. The Bible teaches us that from the moment we are conceived in our mother's womb, which is the moment that we become a living human being, we have a nature that is opposed to God. Right from the start. We have that nature. And in that nature, over time, we grow and we develop in our ability to disobey the Lord. We are therefore, the Bible says, enemies of God, objects of His terrifying and His eternal wrath. That is what it means to be dead in our sins. In the face of that hostility towards God, God, according to His glorious grace, acts in power, in the power of the Holy Spirit to make people who are dead in their sins alive in Christ. Being made alive, we believe in the death and resurrection to pay the debt of our evil deeds, which frees us from the judgment and wrath of God. And it frees us from that forever. That's what we call justification by faith alone. Being made alive, we also have new desires to hate the evil we formerly loved and to love the godly things we formerly hated. That's what we call sanctification. And everyone who has been transformed and is being transformed from death to life by the power of God is part of the universal church. The reason we call this, some people call it the invisible church, the reason why some people call it that is because we don't have the capacity as human beings to see into the heart of another human being, to see if they were genuinely gone from being dead in their sins to alive in Christ. We don't have that capacity as human beings. We don't, and, and just because of the sheer number of it, we also don't have the capacity to have any idea of how many there are in the world, which is why we call the universal church the invisible church. We don't have the capacity as human beings to get a census of that. The local church, on the other hand, is different. It is very visible. We can take account of the people that are a part of it. It The local church is a group of people who meet together regularly to worship in Jesus' name through the singing of hymns and psalms and spiritual songs, according to Ephesians 5.19. For the reading and the preaching of God's word, according to 2 Timothy 4.2. For the celebration of the sacraments, which are the Lord's Supper and baptism. For fellowship and cooperation in the proclamation of the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's the local church. Now, not everyone who belongs to the local church belongs to the universal church. It is possible to sit in a pew week after week. It is possible to take out membership. It is possible to participate in the sacraments. It is possible to be a part of this week after week and remain dead in your sins. That said, it is clearly God's design in His Word to build the universal church, the invisible church made up of all true believers. It is God's design to build His church through the gathering of the visible local church. That's His design. That's how He's worked it out. One of the places in Scripture that describes that for us is 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-6. through 6. Listen to what... Peter says there, he says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. 
like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to Him, that is, as you come to Christ, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. That is a glorious picture of the universal church being built through the local church. In my younger years, I had the opportunity to witness a house being built with stone And though I was far from a happy participant in it, I'm thankful for that because it has given me some insight into what Peter says in this text. One of the things that I have observed is that the mason, the one laying the stone, is the one who decides which stones go in the wall and where they go. A good mason, as they're building the house, as they're building the stone wall, is selecting stones, anticipating which stones are yet to come. Stones often require, before they go into the wall, stones often require pieces being broken off so that they could be reshaped to fit into the wall according to the purpose for which they were chosen. Some of the, this, is, this is my favorite part. Some of the most important stones that go into a wall are little chips of stone, little stone chips. They go into the wall and they are used to cause the bigger stones to sit in the proper place, in the proper way they're supposed to sit. And the thing about stone chips is when the wall's all done, you don't even see them. But they're there. And they're serving an important purpose so that the wall reaches its maximum strength. The Lord is doing all those things with living stones, namely people, people made alive in Christ, being built into a spiritual house that we call the church. Hopefully everyone here this morning wants to be a part of that. Hopefully all of us want to be used by the Lord to build up the church. The Scriptures have a great deal to say to us about how the local church helps to build the universal church, and our text in 2 Corinthians this morning is an example of that. So turn again in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. As the Apostle Paul is bringing his letter to a close here, he reminds the Corinthians of his great desire to build them up rather than tear them down. And as he expresses that desire, he shows us here some important lessons about being a local church that is seeking to do the same. Being a local church church that is seeking to build up the universal church. He gives us three important lessons in this text. Here's the first. Building the church requires dealing with wrongdoing biblically. For as long as we are living in a fallen world, People will do things against the moral will of God. That's going to happen. It's going to happen in the church. And therefore, within the church, we will be faced with the need to deal with evil. And we need to do it in a manner that the Lord prescribes in His Word. Building the church requires dealing with wrongdoing biblically. In verse 1, the apostle clearly points us to the scriptures. Look at 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. He says, This is the third time I am coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. He gets that right from Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, which says that it requires the word of two or three witnesses to establish someone's guilt in the matter of any offense. 
There are at least three bits of wisdom that I believe we can glean from this idea that there needs to be two or three witnesses to bring a charge against someone. First, it offers at least some protection against false accusation. Right? You, need, you need people to agree. Secondly, if more than one person sees an offense, sees a wrongdoing in the same way, it increases the chance that the situation is being assessed correctly. Right? There, is a wis- there is wisdom, the Bible says, in a multitude of counselors. So you have people who are agreeing about the situation. And thirdly, it shows us that people who persist in sin, people who continue on in sin, their sins get noticed. More than one person is going to see, generally speaking, sin comes out. Now while this instruction is both wise and valuable in terms of establishing justice, it's not an absolute guarantee for perfect justice. We see even in the pages of Scripture multiple examples of evil people inflicting harm on others and escaping punishment despite the goodness of God's instructions. We also see people be a lone voice for what is right. There aren't two or three witnesses. There's just one person saying what is right. No one else will band together. We see that in the pages of Scripture. And so we need to remember that when we're dealing with wrongdoing, it's, this is not perfection here. We live in a fallen world, but we need to also remember that the Lord is the final judge of everything and justice will be served from the glory of his throne at some point in history. Nobody gets away with anything. If you're sitting here this morning thinking that you're getting away with sin or that you can hide your sin forever, I plead with you, turn from that foolishness. The Lord sees and he knows, and he will judge. Paul knows that very well, having suffered a great deal of injustice himself, but he also knows that the church cannot ignore the responsibility of dealing with wrongdoing. We need to act, we need to, we need to hold people to account for wrongdoing, and we need to follow the Scripture's advice not advice, that's the wrong word. Strike that from the record. The Scripture's command in dealing with wrongdoing. And that means dealing with people who are persistent in evil deeds. He explains the necessity of it further in verses 2-4. through four. He says, I warned those who sinned before and all the others, and I warn them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them. Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For He was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in Him, but in dealing with you, we will live with Him by the power of God. Notice in these verses here that there are multiple warnings given to those who are persisting in sin. Bringing discipline, bringing action against wrongdoing in the church is not the first response. If we're going to follow the biblical process here, it's rather the last response that comes. If he comes to find people after he's warned them multiple times, if he comes to find people persisting in their sin, he believes it will will be, be because that the church has viewed Paul as weak. God... We don't have to listen to Paul. Look at him. He's not much. He's probably short in stature. He's probably not very powerful in the proclamation of his voice. He doesn't put on a big show. We don't, like, we don't have to worry about him. We don't have to be afraid of him. They perceive him as weak. And he admits that here. He admits that that's the way it appears. But he also reminds them that Jesus also was perceived as weak. He was perceived as weak when he was crucified. Remember when he was up on the cross? What did people do? They came by as he's hanging on the cross, and what did they do? They mocked him. If you're really the king of Israel, if you really have this power, if you're really the Messiah, what do they say? Then save yourself. Even those crucified with him mocked him in the same way, right? Save yourself and us, and then we'll believe in you. They saw Jesus being on the cross as a measure of weakness, but listen, it is not weakness that keeps Christ on the cross. 
What keeps Jesus on the cross is His passion for the glory of God to be displayed through perfect justice as He absorbs the wrath of God upon sin. It's a display of God's perfect justice and it's a display of His immeasurable love that God is unwilling to let His people perish, but He redeems them. His resurrection from the dead leaves no doubt concerning His power. Crucified in weakness, everyone thought He was weak, but then He conquers the grave. That's power. That's the power of God at work in the world. That is the power at work in gospel ministry, in the gospel ministry of the apostle here. If Paul is judged by appearances, then people would see him as weak. But in reality, he is living and he is ministering in the power of God. And, is, and it is according to the power of Christ that he's going to deal with those who are persisting in sin. Jesus gives clear instructions on this in Matthew chapter 18 which is consistent with Paul's quotation of Deuteronomy 19.15 here in verse 1. What does Jesus say? If someone sins against you, what are you to do? You're to go and show him his error. And if he refuses to listen, if he persists in sin, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to take one or two others with you. Why? So that every matter can be established by two or three witnesses. If that doesn't work, if the person still doesn't listen and they persist, then Jesus says, take it to the church. And if that doesn't work, then they are to be put out of the church or treated like an unbeliever, he says in Matthew 18. And at the end of the passage on church discipline that Jesus teaches in Matthew 18, he says this. He says, where two or three are gathered. That is, where two or three are gathered as witnesses against someone else for the purpose of church discipline, he says, I am there also. Sometimes we quote that word, that that verse to make us feel better that nobody showed up to a meeting, right? That there's two or three people together and it's like, don't worry about it, Jesus is with us. That's not the context of the passage. The context of the passage is, If you have two or three witnesses that are gathering to act as witnesses against somebody who has persisted in sin, Jesus is there to also oppose the person persisting in sin. That's what that verse means. If people name the name of Jesus and think they can use His grace as a means to justify persisting in the things that God hates, then Christ Himself is present and He is opposed to such people. And if Jesus is opposed to a local church, then it cannot be used to be building the church. That's impossible. Therefore, wrongdoing cannot be ignored. Neither should it be dealt with in whatever way we might feel is okay. It needs to be dealt with according to God's Word, trusting in the power of God to keep His promise to build His church to His eternal glory. How many of you have ever had a car, been driving in a car, and the engine light comes on? Has that ever happened to anybody? It's still on. You're going to fit right into this illustration then. (laughs) Cars are really complicated today, and those lights can come on for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes those reasons are serious, and sometimes those reasons are minor. And one way you can deal with them is you can deal with them with electrical tape. (laughs) Electrical tape is nice and black, and it's not very see-through. You can just take, cut off a small little piece, put it on the dash, so you can no longer see the light. The problem with that, just covering up the light, the problem with that is that it continues to be a problem. And oftentimes, if you let the problem persist, it will lead to other more serious problems, right? That's how it works. We can fall into that trap in the church. And believe me, I know the temptation of that very well. We see someone persisting in wrongdoing. We see it clearly, but we ignore it, thinking it will be better or easier or thinking that it will get better on its own. I can tell you, it doesn't. It doesn't get better on its own. Most oftentimes, it gets worse. 
Or just think of how people deal with sin. If we ignore it and we don't deal with wrongdoing in biblical ways, think about how people deal with it in unbiblical ways. How about gossip? Instead of going to someone and showing them their fault and showing them their sin and wanting them to turn from it, what do we do? We talk to somebody else about it. You wouldn't believe what so-and-so did to me the other day. Or I heard this, they're doing this on the weekends or whatever. Gossip is one of the ways we deal with things unbiblically. We deal with wrongdoing in the church unbiblically. I can tell you that it doesn't lead to anything good. What it leads to is a feeding of self-righteousness. What it leads to is other things like slander and hypocrisy. Not dealing with wrongdoing, just trying to sweep it under the rug, it can lead to other things. How about bitterness? I'm not willing to confront somebody with their sin. I'm just going to be mad about it. I'm just going to stew in it for a while. And it creates bitterness. What about anger? When people wrong us or do something sinful, it makes us mad, right? You don't deal with it, what happens? You continue to be mad, which can lead to resentment. It can also lead others to embrace wrongdoing, right? If we just ignore things, if we just sweep it under the rug, then what uh, people can see that nobody has said anything to that person about the sin that they're doing, and therefore it must be okay. And so I'll do it too. None of that does anything good in terms of building the church, and that is why Jesus gives us a pattern to follow to deal with wrongdoing. Believe me, I know firsthand that is hard. But it is necessary. And that prepares us for another lesson that the Apostle gives us. This one, I believe uh, many people in our own time have failed to appreciate and to pay attention to this, and it has made the church worse off in terms of its ability to build the church. Here's the lesson. Building the church requires perseverance instead of presumption. I believe wholeheartedly that the Lord wants His people to be fully confident in the work of Christ. I want, uh, he wants us to be confident in that for our hope for eternal life, and He wants that confidence to be based on the evidence of a transformed heart. Building the church requires perseverance instead of presumption. One of the most common questions I've gotten over the years as a pastor is people will ask me on a somewhat regular basis this question, can someone lose their salvation? How many people have ever heard that question before? Can someone lose their salvation? There is not a doubt in my mind. Not a doubt that the Bible's answer to that question is a resounding no. You cannot lose your salvation. As I said at the beginning of our time together, being a Christian is the result of God making people who are dead in their sins alive in Christ to the eternal praise of His glorious grace. And when God makes you alive, you don't go back to being dead. That doesn't happen. A person in Christ is immovably secure, held fast in the power of Christ forever. Now rightly understood, that true, that true statement is a good gift to the individual believer and it is a good gift to the church as a whole. But sadly, many people have both misunderstood and misapplied the truth that you cannot lose your salvation. Some have reduced salvation to things like praying a prayer or signing a card or raising a hand when everybody else's eyes are closed. Getting baptized or some other external affirmation of repentance and faith. You do those things and you're good, they'll say. 
All those things may indeed be affirmations of being made alive in Christ. The Bible commands that we baptize people, right? We're not going to stop doing that. This is a sacrament of the church. Of course we're going to baptize people. And baptism can be, absolutely, ought to be, should be a genuine confession of faith of someone being made alive in Christ. But all of those things that I mentioned can be done by someone who is still dead in their sins. And therefore, on their own, raising a hand, signing a card, praying a prayer, getting baptized, on their own, they can do nothing for anyone. And we do a terrible disservice to people if we tell them to have confidence in their eternal destiny because they mouthed a prayer, because they raised a hand, or because they signed a card. If we turn the gospel into a get-out-of-jail-free card, then we are setting people up to believe that they're on their way to heaven when in reality they're on their way to hell. Paul tells us something very different in verses 5 and 6 here. Listen to what he says. He says this, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find, I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. The idea here is a thorough testing of yourself to see the reality of your being in Christ, to see it revealed. No believer ought to presume that they have been born again. Instead, we should regularly look at our lives for the evidence that Christ is at work in us. That is what is driving the apostle when he asks the question, do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? His point here is that if you have been made alive in Christ by the power of God through the work of the Holy Spirit, then something's going to be happening in your life. The examining or the testing here is not creating faith. It is revealing faith. A few years ago, I watched a several episodes of a show called Forged in Fire. Anybody else see that show? It's a show about blacksmiths who compete with one another in taking hunks of steel of various things and they make knives and swords and other similar weapons. And in order to see who had made the best knife or sword or weapon, whatever the test was, in order to see who had done the best job, they would subject the, what had been made to various tests. They tried to take the knives and they tried to chop through all kinds of things like blocks of ice, like nails, uh, sheet metal, thick blocks of wood, and like one episode they even fired a bullet at a blade. It was kind of cool. The bullet split in half. It was pretty sweet. <laughs> now not one of those tests that they subjected those blades to, not one of those tests changed the quality of the steel. The steel was the steel was the steel. What those tests did is they revealed the quality of the steel. That's what the testing does. And it's the same idea with examining ourselves to see if we're in the faith. This is something everyone who truly believes should want to do. This is something we should want in our lives, not something we should be afraid of or, or fearful of or try and shy away from it. We should want to see if, in fact, we have been made alive in Christ. You should want to know that. If we are truly in Christ, there is no fear in this examination. But instead, there is a building up of our confidence in the irreversible and transforming work of Almighty God that is happening in our hearts. So how do we do that? How do we set about examining ourselves to see if we are in fact in the faith? Well, we ask questions about ourselves to see if there is evidence in our lives of the qualities of genuine faith that the Bible describes. The Bible tells us what it looks like to be in Christ. First of all, we need to examine our confession of faith. 
Confession simply means that we agree with God. Have we agreed with God that we have failed to live up to His standards and we deserve an eternity in hell? Have we agreed with God on that point? We need to. If you're alive in Christ, you will agree with that point. Have we agreed with God that the only way to meet His standards is to trust in the death that Jesus died for us and His resurrection through which He conquers the grave and that His perfection, the perfect righteousness that He has is then applied to us to our account on the basis of our faith? Do we believe that? If you're in Christ, you will. Do we believe that the Bible, these 66 particular books, do we believe that the Bible is the Word of God and do we desire to have our lives determined by it? If we're in Christ, we will. In other words, when we're asking questions about the confession of our faith, the question is, do we have the right kind of faith? We need more than to simply have faith in something. Everybody has that. Everybody has faith in something. He says here, examine yourselves not to see if you have faith. He says examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. So we must believe rightly. But there's more than that. Being made alive in Christ changes our affections and our desires. Here's a good question to ask. You want to know if you're in the faith. You want to examine yourself. Ask yourself this question. Do you love God? Do you delight in His glory? Do you delight in His worship? Do you have any desire to obey Him because you want to and not because you have to? If you do, if those things are in your heart, there's only one place where those things come from. There's only one place where a love of God and a desire to live for Him come from, and that's the Holy Spirit. Do you have any affection? Here's another good question to ask. Do you have any affection for fellow believers? It's a little hard to answer that one in the affirmative at times. That's the chief way in which Jesus said we would be known as His disciples, our love for one another. How about Galatians 5.22, which lists the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you see any of those things in your life in increasing measure? This isn't a static thing. Fruit grows, right? Things grow. Now, none of these things save us. This test, this examining of ourselves doesn't save us. We never add anything to the work of Christ. Nothing. We contribute nothing to our righteousness. These things don't save us. They reveal the reality of our salvation. Examine yourself to see if you are in Christ. These are some of the things that God does in the hearts of His people. And if you're truly in the faith, you'll be able to see it. You'll be able to see His work. And you will want it to continue. Salvation is not something genuine believers presume based on the raising of a hand or offering lip service to God Salvation is something genuine believers persevere in because they have been transformed by the power of God through the grace of God. If we want to be used by God to build His church, we need to call people to perseverance, not presumption. I want you to go into eternity with great confidence built on solid evidence, not on some flimsy profession you made 600 years ago. Well, we don't live that long. 60 years ago, whatever. That brings us to one more lesson from this text about building the church. We have to handle wrongdoing biblically. That's number one. We have to call people to perseverance and not presumption. That's number two. 
And thirdly, building the church means caring about people, not appearances. We need to care about people living in obedience to the Lord for the sake of God's glory and their highest good, rather than how their behavior one way or another makes us look. Building the church means caring about people, not appearances. Appearances had become quite a big issue in the relationship between Paul and the Corinthians. From what we read in this letter, it's safe to say that a good number of people in the church had bought into the lie that presentation, appearance, was more important than substance. It's a very easy thing to fall into that trap, to value how people perceive us above what is really real. Paul doesn't fall into that trap with these believers. He says this in verse 7. He says, But we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we, though we may seem to have failed. At the end of verse 6, he expresses his hope that they will be able to see that he and his fellow gospel workers are indeed genuine. They, are, they have passed the test. They are indeed in Christ. But he has a bigger priority in mind than how they perceive than how the church perceives him and his fellow workers. He prays about their well-being. He says, I pray that you will do what is right. Instead of praying about what they will think about him and his fellow workers, he's praying that they would do what is right. It's like he's saying, if you're living rightly, but you don't see us in a very good light, if your opinion of us isn't very high, but you're doing well in Christ, I'm good with that. I'm okay with that gives his reason in verse 8. For, this is why he's praying like this, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. Because of his call as an apostle and because of God's grace at work in him, he is concerned about God's truth rather than himself. That is such an incredible gift to be able to rest in the truth of God without being worried about what other people think about us. It is one of the things that frees us to care about people and to care about their well-being even when they don't think much about us. He makes that clear in verse 9. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. He seems to be more than okay with looking weak. He seems to be more than okay with whatever appearance they, whatever, whatever they think of him as long as they're doing well. He's okay with looking weak. In fact, it says he makes, it makes him happy when he's perceived as weak and the Corinthians are perceived as strong. I think what he means by strength there is that they're doing well. Why say that? Verse 10 answers the question. He says, For this reason I write these letters while I'm away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. The whole reason he has written, all that he's written in this letter the whole reason he has said what he said to the church in the past is so that when he comes to the church in person, these things would already be worked out. They would already be set in order so that, as one commentator puts it, he doesn't have to flex his spiritual muscle. He can. He's, in reality, he is not weak. He's got the power of God behind him and he can flex that. He's hoping not to have to do that. He's okay if they continue to perceive him as weak as long as they're on the right track. He doesn't care if the church thinks that he is timid and weak if they have turned from their sin and they're growing spiritually. That's the whole reason God has given him his authority as an apostle. It's to build the church up, not to tear it down. He's concerned about people rather than appearances. How many people remember the parable Jesus taught called the Good Samaritan? You remember that? There's a guy, Jesus tells a story about a guy, he's going on a trip and he gets ambushed for robber, by robbers. He's robbed, he's beaten up, and he's left for dead on the side of the road. And three people pass by. Remember the three people? First, there's a priest 
Who remembers what the priest does in the parable when he sees the uh, guy beaten up on the side of the road? What does he do? Somebody shout it out. He walks by. Doesn't do anything. Just carries on. Next person to come by is a Levite. What's the Levite do? Anybody remember? Same thing. He just passes by. And then a Samaritan comes along. And he cleans the guy up. He hauls him off to an inn. He bandages up his wounds and he makes sure that his needs are cared for and that he's looked after. Now to the original hearers of that story, it would have been extremely offensive because priests and Levites were supposed to be the godliest of men in society, the most well-respected of people, and here they were just passing on by, not caring about someone. Samaritans, on the other hand, were looked rather Low, looked upon as rather lowly in society. In fact, most Jews hated Samaritans. And here comes a Samaritan doing the right thing. And I ask a question, why doesn't the Levite, why doesn't the priest stop to help? Well, it may be because they're just totally heartless and could care less about people. That's possible. But it probably also has to do with the fact that they didn't want to make themselves ceremonially unclean. That they, were care, they, they cared ma- more about ceremony and appearances than they did about people. That's an easy thing to fall into. If the church is full of people, if every spot in the pew, every spot in every pew is full, people are given lots of money and we're in the black and everything is great but they're godless in their affections. Are we okay with that? Is that good enough? Are we okay with a full church of people on their way to hell? It's temptation. If we are up to our neck in sin and hurting people close to us, but most people think that we're awesome, is that good enough? Are we happy with the appearance? If people think we're fools because we spend our time and money on helping other people to know the Lord, can we rejoice in that? Are we willing to risk people spreading rumors and lies about us for the sake of calling others to righteousness? Do we care more about people than appearances? If we want to be used by God for the purpose of building up His church, then we have to. We know from the promise of Christ that He will build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. This is a work of God. It will not prevail fail the only question that we need to ask ourselves is do we want to be a part of it do we want to be a part of building the church if we do if we want to be a local church that is used by God to build up the universal church then we need to be a church who's willing to deal with wrongdoing and deal with it biblically We need to be a church that calls people to perseverance rather than presumption. And we need to be a people who care more about others than we do about appearances. It is a glorious task. And I pray that by God's grace, we would trust in Him doing things His way for His glory and for the eternal good of His people. Let's pray. God, you give us all that you do in your word, and you command all that you command for our highest good. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of gathering together with these people this morning to sing your praises and to worship you. I truly believe we've been gathered together by your grace, for our good, for your glory. 
and for the proclamation of your glorious gospel, the gospel of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. God, increase our desire for such things, I pray. We need you to increase our desire because it's not an easy task, but it is a wonderfully glorious one. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.